I need your shampoo. Yes, there you go. Or anything else? Product. Product. Thank you. I don't know if we have that side of the Ms. McKee, we're live. Thank you. Good evening and welcome, everyone, to the September 22nd meeting of the uh, Council Rock Education Committee. Uh, we're going to begin with introductions, if we can, to my left. Althea Tomlinson, Supervisor of Curriculum and Instruction. Andrea Mangold, Team Supervisor and Community Relations. Bob Hickey, School Board. Mike Thorberg, School Board. Ed Salomon, School Board. Matt Peters, IP Director. Michael Roosevelt, School Board. Andy Sanko, Superintendent. Al Funk, Director of Secondary Education. Nicole Crawford, Director of Elementary Education. And Jeff Pine, School Board. And Mary McKee, School Board. Uh, thank you, everyone. And on the phone tonight, do we have anyone calling in? Okay, I don't hear anyone yet. If they join the meeting in progress, they'll be recognized. We have two agenda items tonight. We're going to have an update on STEAM and on interrupted learning. I believe we're going to start with Ms. Mangle. Yes, as soon as I move that forward. Uh, that's a quick picture, a photograph that was taken earlier this week. That's one of our STEAM teachers, Tracy Geller, with her students. Uh, that is at Hillcrest Elementary. Elementary school, that's right. Um, I'll go to the next slide because it's got the, uh, the important information. So a Council Rock first occurred back in September. We have 4,630 elementary students representing 194 different classes in grades 1 through 6. Six months ago, we had zero, as Mr. Mm -hmm. just pointed out. So now we've got almost 5,000 kids who at least once a week are being immersed in and introduced to STEAM-based instruction weekly. Um, one of the things that's important about STEAM, and you know how I personally feel about it, uh, but it, it really is truly making a difference for a lot of these students. Before I go on, I want to thank the school board for having the vision to bring STEAM into the elementary classroom. I want to thank you for allowing our STEAM teachers to have the latitude to create a program that's rigorous and engaging for kids. And I also want to thank the STEAM specialists for taking your vision and turning it into a reality because they're working very hard and they're doing a fantastic job. And we have one of them here tonight, Marianne, who's one of our STEAM specialists. Um, so those numbers are impressive and they quantify a shift in instructional practice to include a challenging, dynamic, and broad scope of knowledge. And what that is, is a lot of words saying that kids are seeing and being exposed to things that they might not get in a traditional classroom setting, a, a different content knowledge, different way of thinking of things. Because STEAM gives the students a chance to think critically outside the confines of tr traditional classroom. And it broadens the way they see themselves as learners. Uh, one of the things that I read recently about STEAM, it talked about um, differences in learning as opposed to learning differences, meaning that students that typically have maybe what is identified as a learning disability, those disabilities actually become advantages in the STEAM classroom because what teachers are looking for is innovative thinking. So kids that typically might be quieter or not want to share an idea in the STEAM classroom, that's exactly what's encouraged, that kind of, um, it's not even out of the box thinking, there is no box. It's just innovative thinking. Um, all of the administrators here tonight have been in the STEAM classrooms and witnessed for themselves uh, the teaching and learning that's happening. I encourage you, if you see any student, I know Mr. Solomon has, has one of his own, but if you do see an elementary student in a building, any student, that's how I do it. I just stop the student in the hallway and tell me what you think of STEAM. Um, they love it. I sent out a very informal survey uh, to one classroom just to see what the, I think they were fifth graders, what they said, what their response was. And of course, not only are the comments adorable, but you can feel the push for more already. Well, we can't wait to get to this, we can't wait to get to that. I'm going to go on to the next slide because it's a little, a little more helpful. So this is a picture. That these were uh, students in Hara Hanfinger's class, and they were making um, uh, paper chains, which at first seems you know, rather simplistic, but it wasn't because she really just, you know, gave them a goal, gave them a problem, and they had to solve it. You can see on the table there is a STEAM journal. So one of the things that we're doing is we're having every student create a STEAM journal. And that STEAM journal is just a compilation of their ideas. It doesn't have to be anything that's going to be graded. It's just a reflection of their thinking and their learning. So that'll give us a nice baseline of exactly what these kids are learning in the, in the STEAM classroom. Also, to the right, that the uh, graphic there, 
that is uh, taken from the YES program at Penn State University. So um, we'll go back a little bit. But one of the curriculums that we're using this year is called Engineering is Elementary. Might sound familiar because our third grade uses it or used it in the science curriculum for Bridges program. So we've kind of expanded on it. it. It is published or produced rather by the Museum of Science in Boston. And the woman who created the program has left the Museum of Science in Boston and now she's affiliated with Penn State. She's starting her own program to uh, go up like Engineering is Elementary 2.0. She wants to kick it up a notch and make it available, uh, not so commercially, for lack of a better word. So that is her graphic. That's a graphic that she created because it's ideal for elementary students. It's a really simple way of looking at the engineering design process. So um, I have a couple of takeaways here from what's happened so far in the last couple of weeks. Students are loving STEAM. Uh, the language, as you can see up there, it's very simple language, but it's more of the way it's put into a process form that, that kids can grasp onto. The hope is that as kids work their way through their years, um, this kind of thinking is going to be what they do when their tire goes flat over on Woodburn Road on their way to the mall. They're going to have to go through that same process of problem solving. So it's much more than STEAM. It's a way of looking at life in the world. Um, one of the things I noticed in that classroom, um, at, actually at that table, and that's why I put that picture in there, there were three boys and three girls <coughs> working in a group. And I would have expected these were third graders that the girls would go together and the boys would go together. But they didn't. They were so focused on the problem, and they kept going back to the problem because she had a little graphic on the table, that the, laying, uh, the playing field was totally leveled for boys and girls. It didn't matter how loud you were, how boisterous you were, there wasn't a hand, an assistant hand up like boys sometimes do. Uh, there was no command of the teacher's attention. That was a group of kids working together to solve a problem. And then look at other tables and see how they were doing, and then maybe borrowing an idea from another group of students. Um, so it's, it's really a fabulous program, and I applaud the school board for having the vision to see it and do it and make it happen. I met with uh, one of the uh, technology and engineering coordinators at the middle and high school. And he and I talked about vertical integration, meaning we, we both share the idea that the high school, middle, and elementary schools should have a common language. He showed me the engineering design process as it's taught in the high school. And it's, it's almost the same thing, except the words are a little bigger and, and the image is a little um, more sophisticated for an older child. But it's the same exact thing. And that is the engineering. Exactly. It is. It is. It is. Exactly. But, but what's interesting is we talked about the, the students he's going to get next year in seventh grade. Now we'll have seen that. Where this year's seventh graders may have, not have any idea. So we talked about, okay, so um, actually the people at Penn State were kind enough to give us a, a little bit of counseling. And they suggested we do something called an asset map, find out where our STEAM assets are in the district. And they don't mean material, they mean people. People with experience, knowledge. And to, to have that map start at the elementary school and lead up to the high school so that ultimately we're graduating students who have experience and are prepared to go into these professions after graduation. So, any questions or comments? Anything from the board? Dr. Fillmore. I'll go first. Um, no questions, a couple of comments. The journal is important because. I carry a lab book anytime I'm doing research, so I'm glad you started early on that. Mm -hmm. to get Have you considered there's a lot of steam happening in the high schools? Have you considered a buddy system? Oh, where... yes. I can tell you what we're going to do. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mary, I'll be hearing this for the first time. So what we're doing is we, we have a couple of in-service days coming up. We're going to put everybody in a room. We're going to put all the high school teachers that teach something in the steam disciplines, middle school, elementary, put them all together so they can see and do and have an idea of what, what do you teach and, and how can I use that. And then we did talk about um, having high school students go down to the elementary school, volunteer maybe, just the way the schedule works. The only concern I had with that is students who take steam earlier in the day don't <coughs> get the benefit of being around a high school student because they're in school. But there's and ways we can work around that. So yes, that was what I was. If the big kids went mm -hmm. and hung out with the little kids, mm -hmm. um, it's it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I mean, know there's a schedule. We had a, a rocket club. 
there was no way. I only had two hands. So they came down and, you know, every every group was assigned a high school student and they built them together. So it's kind of cool. Any chance we can witness one sometime? Witness? A class. Oh, my gosh. Without being right Absolutely. I, so. I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to do so. Now, if you go in, here's what I've learned. Don't be the adult in the room. Sit down at a table. Grab a pair of scissors. Yeah. Grab a crayon and, and say, what are you doing? These kids, the kids in the picture, were cutting, um, again, paper rings. And this one girl, she's cutting away, and it's all crooked. And this other girl was you know, playing with her hair, saying, would you please cut them in straight lines? Every time you make a curve, you're making it longer and short. So they were bickering, and then somebody else took the scissors. And I said, oh, an idea because they only had a certain amount of blue tape, like a short amount of blue painters tape, and they were, you know, pulling off big chunks. And I just kind of said, you know, you, know, you can tear that with your, you know, like your scissors. So I kind of, you know, put my finger on the scale a little bit to help them. But I encourage you very much so to go into those classrooms. You're going to like it. Too. One seems specialist said to me recently that one of her students said, "I want to be an engineer when I grow up," mm -hmm. wow. and that was great to hear. Uh, just not even in a month in the school, mm -hmm. and, and to hear that connection, that starting their connecting those dots and seeing themselves as engineers and in the work that they're doing, it's pretty awesome. This is fun. Another question? Yeah, um, I mean, it's great, and it's, I mean, I can't believe so quickly mm -hmm. but we're able to create such a program. So it sounds like this is more engineering focus, right? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. Much more than engineering. The engineering design process is a, a term of art used to help students learn how to solve problems, very much like the scientific method used to be. If a student had a question about anything, we were taught to have a hypothesis and then test your hypothesis and then take your results. So it's being displaced with the engineering design process just as a way of thinking. One can look at that and look at art that way, writing that way, mathematics that way. So it's it's a mode of thinking that could be applied to all any discipline, not just the STEAM disciplines. So while we use terms like engineering, engineering isn't building a bridge or, or fixing a car. It's the way that you construct your thinking about the world. It's how you bake a cake. It's how you take care of a baby really is engineering in there. So engineering is, is meant in a broader sense. So where we're used to that traditional term, these students are being raised up in a world where these skills are necessary in order for them to be productive citizens and stewards of, of our planet. I mean, they're going to be facing issues and problems that none of us in this room can even imagine at this point. And I would much rather them be able to look at a problem and go through critically and say, you know what, I'm stuck here at the ask. I don't even know what the question is. Or, I fail. Man, I failed. I gotta go back. What, at what point is, my, is there a failure in what I have in front of me here? Failure is, is good. It wasn't good 30 years ago. Failure was a bad thing. My father was a school principal. If I failed, if I got something wrong, I was in trouble. It was, a, it was clearly an act punishable by death to, to bring home a poor grade when in all likelihood now looking upon, you know, back on myself, I was that out of the box, odd thinking kid looking out the window saying, why are those clouds purple? And while Sister Avila was, you know, you know, beating with the little thing. But anyway, I, I'm going off. I'm just saying that engineer, it's more than engineering. The word is there, but it has a different connotation. Today's class yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's a scientific process. So to just call it engineering, I mean, I know it's easier for the kids to understand that, but I just don't think it's fair because it puts down the rest of the sciences <laughs> because it's really, um, but you know, I see that it's it's an easy way to describe it. I just mm -hmm. don't want them to think that they have to become an engineer because of that, because they can become anything they want following this process, not following the And that's the whole aim of the program, is to introduce them. And Mary, I can even speak to that about the different fabrication, the coding, all the different things that they're going to be doing that veer away from engineering. Right. I mean, you could, if you, when we start building in art, and even music to engineer, I mean, it's there. You don't even have to use the term engineering, but right. the structure on which most higher order thinking occurs 
is in a process of, again, creativity, failure, and trying again. Just how the human mind is. All we did was put a, a label on what, what children do naturally. I mean, if you set a group of kids out on the playground, if you ever watch them with, I don't know, a chalk or something, and, and just watch it, they go through that cycle over and over again. And one could say that that's art. That's the way art is created, a nascent artist on the playground. So, and it's new, so, you know, I'm gonna work. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm super excited about this. Thank you. I, you know, I just was stuck with it, believe me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, good job. I, I'm, I'm encouraged. I love hearing the passion in your voice, and I think that that demonstrates uh, both a, a proper selection from Dr. Sanko as well as a proper appointment of you. So this is wonderful, and I'm glad you touched on that. That's what I wanted to discuss is, is the scientific method or the engineering method, and it really is a, a good understanding for life skills to recognize that our, the first idea might not be the best idea. To recognize that just because it works doesn't mean it's the best. To recognize just because you fail doesn't mean that you quit. I mean, all of these things are built into that method. And having a child, I think at this point, this generation, and after the, you know, the learning loss years that we've, that we've come across, it's really fabulous to hear such encouragement um, that it's working, that you have boys and girls working together, that you've got collaboration at different levels. Um, and that you've got, uh, that you get kids that say, this is what I want to be when I grow up. And I know they're going to change their mind a bunch of times. My best friend wanted to be a fireman and an astronaut and a police, you know, and a policeman, and he was none of them. So, it, it, you know, th this, this is great, I think, just to teach that. And it, and it does permeate <coughs> through a lot of different elements. And I think that it helps us, even as adults, and this, these children that are becoming adults, to recognize what you do when you fail and what you do when you succeed, it doesn't necessarily mean that you stop. And I think that it helps and instructs all of us on how we can work together. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear this. Thank you. Mr. Hickey? Uh, yeah, I think, much like Mike said, I think the trickle down effect of you heading up this program is <laughs> going to be very good. You know, like I said, your excitement and everything else that you've been doing for a while. Um, one thing I'll ask, maybe a favor that you could get, if you could get to me like a, like a sample syllabus or lesson plan. Oh, absolutely. You know, like send me, but just so I have an idea of, you know, sure. how it all flows. Much to like Yoda's point, who was saying like, you know, she doesn't want the concentration on the engineering. I'd, I'd like to see like what else is in there. What else is in there? Where, where, where's this going to be in a couple of months? Like when we pivot to the art section mm -hmm. or you know the math sure. section so if you could get me a, like like i said either like a, a long-term syllabus just even an out like i said an outline or a, a lesson plan that'd be great i appreciate it so i think a majority of the credit goes to the theme specialists because what they did was they worked together and they gave it the first four to six weeks just to get the classroom management down most of these teachers are coming from being a full-time classroom teacher into being a specialist teacher which is a little well, it's a big, it's a big shift. And then getting kids to the, the place where if they didn't know what STEAM was, what it represented, getting them to a place where, what do we, why are we here? What do we do? Who are you? You're a new teacher. So they, they really came up with some clever, uh, worthwhile activities for the first front end of the year. And then they'll be gradually moving on to this engineering as elementary. And as I said, we've got some coding and fabrication and some other things uh, that, that we're planning on. So um, again, kudos to them for, for having the wherewithal to, to put this together. And also, again, to the board for giving them the latitude to do that. Because what we're building is lasting, it's viable, and it's strong. Because it's, it's council rock. It's so coming from us. It's not something that we're pulling off the shelf. So thank you for that. Great. Any other questions or comments? Mary, I'll just make a comment. Please. Please. So it's only September, and you're getting the excitement from Andre Mangle, who I've experienced for the last 10 years, <laughs> it being in Hollywood, but this is, that's her. And, and, she, and I think it's a to put a team together that's going to do that type of work, and it's exciting. We've talked about it for years. Finally, okay. being able to position the district to get something that other districts have had. Right. Uh, it's been rewarding from a board perspective, and I think the community's on, you know, some are saying, 
got the item, others mm -hmm. are saying this is great, others are saying what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So it's great to have that, you know, a once over what we're doing. A couple comments that I would have. The one thing I love about this is we're writing our own curriculum as we do this. Because we can do that. We don't need to pull something off the shelf and spend a lot of money doing it. We put a team together that's doing it. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to learn from our mistakes. Just, just for me, you know, we talked about budgets last night in separate conversations, uh, some of us at least. Let's let's keep an eye on how we're spending money. Mm -hmm. If we need more, you know me, I don't like to shortchange right. areas where kids are striving uh, because we, it's an unknown for us, mm -hmm. this program. How much is it going to cost? Uh, much like the Bridges program, there's stuff that comes along with extras every year. <clears throat> I just don't want to, you know, shortchange any kid. Um, but we're going to learn this as we, as the year pro progresses. Um, I also want to know about things that aren't working, critiquing ourselves constantly, mm -hmm. um, because this is the first year of the rollout. Right. Um, but you know, one of the negative things I've read about steam is that it gets to a point where it loses steam, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's going to happen because I know you. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge is always going to be there, but that's challenge you have to put on your team. Mm -hmm. And I think us watching this, not as an overseer, so to speak, but as being a cheerleader to this process, you know, it's important for me that it stays fresh and stays good. Mm -hmm. When you ask my Emma how a scheme, she says it's fun. That's about the best you're going to get out of that kid. But that's okay because she's enjoying it. Right. But the things that she's going to learn is many of the things you talk about, how to work with others, how to express yourself, how to be frustrated and fix that deconflict. Mm -hmm. You know, things that, that many kids can't do. And the best thing about kids is if you leave them alone long enough, they can fix it. Um, sometimes, most of the time, enable your kids to fix it. But this is exciting. Uh, I'd like to see it back in a couple months. Absolutely. Uh, well, um, and hear more and see more and smell more and do oh, more. Oh, sure. All this. And I know, I know, I know what you do. I know your body of work. Uh, and I appreciate everything you've done. Well, one thing I will say, one cautionary thing is that um, this rollout did not come without challenges. Um, one of those is no one um, said it was going to be easy. Right. Oh, no, well, actually, you know what? There are more practical challenges than they are academic. Um, one is space. Yeah. Well, it's not, we it doesn't look the same at Hillcrest as it does mm -hmm. at Wrightstown. So that's a challenge that, fortunately, we have principal and Mrs. Crawford and the teacher who are willing to, you know, it's it's kind of weird, but use the engineering design process to solve that problem. And it and it's we're using steam to solve the steam issue. And then another thing, um, I would say thus far, probably the most interesting expenditure has been stuff, pipe cleaners and, and tape and, and paper and just the, the kinds of supplies that when you're teaching, like on average about 650 kids each, that's a lot of paper and a lot of tape and a well, lot then you of- Well, that with our science kids right. for our grade levels yep. and everything else and bridges yep. and everything else that we, mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying, I just want to be careful and that we know as a collective board and a collective team that costs are here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think they're going to fluctuate every year based on what we're seeing in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, but I just don't want to hear we can't do because of something money related. Um, and it might be because we didn't realize it. But that's okay. Let's have that conversation. And don't forget um, grants as they roll out throughout well, the year. Well, there's grants there. there. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. And, and I walk a fine line be what a PTO does and what. Right. Should do, mm -hmm. but we do have viable alternatives out there that can help the process go, especially in the in these infant years. I think it's important. Thank you. If I may, just one more comment. Because a lot of people worried about focusing on engineering, and this, you know, the word engineering, as a practicing engineer and a scientist, the E in STEAM is just the other letters smushed into it. Engineering is nothing except science and math technology and art used in yep. unison to solve a problem. Yep. Engineering by itself doesn't exist. I mean, it just does it, it, it is the fusion of the other letters in steam. Let's not forget that. I mean it really is just um, Mike and I are, are practice two different completely different fields, but we use the same things. It's right. just how we do it. Um, and so I, I don't want that to get lost either. It, 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 it'll, it'll all fall out in the end. Mm -hmm. so, um, just so we know. It's great. That's great. I um, really appreciate that presentation. And thanks to you and to all of the teachers yes. working on this. Please pass on our gratitude uh, for the work that's been accomplished. And as enthusiastic as you are, I think I sense from my board colleagues, 
we share the, your enthusiasm for this program. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much. So now we're moving on to a slightly less uplifting topic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there's been uh, much discussion across the Commonwealth, across the nation for that matter, about um, the learning that has taken place over the last three academic years. And it probably should not come as a surprise to anyone that most research indicates that students learn less while traditional schooling was interrupted during COVID. The degree and the size of those learning discrepancies is certainly subject to debate and dependent on a whole host of variables. For our part, we wish to acknowledge the mislearning opportunities and work to support programs and instructional practices which will foster growth for all CR students. In a way, the tried and true in-person instructional practices we implemented pre-COVID and have been returning to a little bit more consistently have been reaffirmed. So interrupted learning is the umbrella phrase, which we think represents the overall picture of what occurred during the last three years. It encompasses learning loss, while also acknowledging the teaching and learning that did take place during these less than ideal conditions. For example, everyone seemed to improve in the area of learning technology by virtue of the circumstances. So striking a balance between those lost opportunities in the classroom and learning loss while recognizing some of the peripheral, peripheral positives, whether that was technology or resiliency, is what we're trying to capture when we utilize the term interrupted learning. Of course, the $64,000 question for us is how do we address the learning gaps and the discrepancies that do exist? So please know that the administration and our teaching staff are committed to making this a priority this academic year. We recently received assessment results for the Keystone exams and the PSSAs. We're in the process of compiling all that data. We're gonna break it out into individual grade levels, cohorts and by school. Um, and certainly we'll examine that also under the microscope of interrupted learning. This evening, what we wanted to do was just highlight for the subcommittee, some of the areas we have already explored and will continue to explore that we think will address, further address these learning gaps. So namely, we want to speak to the committee about our CR Summer Academy, um, continuing to refine best instructional classroom, uh, classroom practices, and then finally speak a little bit about our um, curricular pilot programs, which are on trial. And these programs, they pay particular attention to remediation and intervention. So again, this is one more effort to try to address those learning discrepancies. Okay, so the Summer Academy, I just want to begin by acknowledging the great leadership of Mrs. Gina Booth, who is the person that built that program and led it and it was very very successful these last couple of years so just some important information that we want to share that we hosted 513 students in rising grades 1 through 12 this past summer it's designed to address just as I said that to close that learning gap that we obviously are, are working on since the recent pandemic this program is federally funded through ESSER funds. That's the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Again, 513 students were involved in this. We had 48 staff, 19 instructional assistants, and it ran from July 11th to the 28th. I was able to stop by briefly to the academy this summer and just the excitement from the students. I mean, any time to be learning during the summer and seeing that excitement is definitely a reflection of this great program and the committed staff that were there day in and day out helping to provide a great experience for them. I was really impressed when I learned from, from Gina that it had an 86% daily attendance rate. So 
these are the academic courses that were uh, provided over the summer during the academy. And I just want to highlight tonight that these courses did focus on the priority standards and they were found within each grade level and or course. So that just gives you a sense of what was available to students. talk a little bit about our continued focus now as a result of uh, that learning loss that, that Mr. Funk spoke about. Well, certainly the last year was more typical than the year prior. Teachers and staff are continuing to implement and, strength, and strengthen their instructional best practices for meeting the needs of all students. They're using ongoing assessments to differentiate instruction to help support our students. Intervention time is continuing to be scheduled and teachers are using formative data to determine how to best meet, meet the needs of students during this time. This includes lessons and activities for not only struggling learners, but those students who need enrichment and extension for those higher order thinking skills. Small group support and instruction will continue to be implemented in order to meet the needs of all learners. And we're going to continue to work on strengthening our student and teacher collaboration. It is the highest of priorities for us. If students are feeling good and connected to their students and the staff that they work with every day, the better success that we will see um, each day in school. I'm proud to share that all 10 elementary schools are in the process of refi refining our frameworks to have a more consistent approach to identifying and responding to student needs. The sole focus this year will be on data, looking at data, helping teachers and staff to be comfortable with data and how to respond to data. So I'm really excited about that. We're continuing our work with PBIS, and as a reminder, that stands for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Support at both the elementary and middle school levels to address the social and emotional needs of students. We're bridging any gaps in student learning and it remains a priority as we share for all administration, teachers, and staff. These are uh, pilots that we, the programs that we're piloting this year. We're continuing to look at, whenever we're looking at new materials, we're focused also on the interventions that are embedded in those resources. And so that is something that we're going to continue to monitor this year to make sure that these pilots are supporting our students the best way that they can. We're going to work with Mrs. Tomlinson as well as the teachers and the buildings that are involved in these pilots to be able to collect data to see how our students are responding to them. Are they working? Um, are they programs that we want to continue next year? I can personally speak to the K-1 Horizons reading program. We recently had a training here at Chancellor, and it was excellent. Very well done. The time that I was in there, I could see the excitement from the kindergarten and first grade teachers of the, of the schools that are participating. And they're very anxious to get me in, as well as Mrs. Tomlinson, to be able to see it up and running and to see how they're meeting the needs of our, of our students. Uh, we'll be presenting the results of these pilots later on this year during one of our education committee meetings. <coughs> Open to questions and comments. Yes, Dr. Fogler. Talking about learning loss, you know I've got to go. Um, first, I'd like to thank you, um, thank all of you, because you've actually stepped up and said it happened, which we haven't had in the past. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and I'm grateful for your attempt to fix it. I mean, I, I read a lot of research, too, that any lost learning uh, translates into lost finances later in life, lost, lost time living. There's lots of things that, that uh, landed on these kids that I don't know if they'll ever get back, but I, I, I certainly appreciate the heroics to try and get them back for them. So I, I first want to say thank you. You know, if I come off negative, I, uh, it, it's not, I, it, it's very positive. I'm, I'm grateful that you're staring it in the face and dealing with it. You're, you're taking that for a second. Um, one of the things I'm noticing, and I only notice at the high school level because that's where my kids are now, uh, the learning loss, didn't happen uniformly either. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could, if anybody's got any comments on that. Some kids 
because of home life, because of who they are, for whatever, um, are, are radically accelerated over others because, let's be honest, in some, in some ways, they were unencumbered by a curriculum. They could just move at their pace and go. The flip side I see, too, where kids struggle in that environment and are way behind it. Can anybody talk to, I mean, that's, that's a big disparity. I'm going to see it in every classroom. I mean, I mean, I think your observations are right on. I mean, the best way to describe what happened was it was very disjointed. So when you talk about, I mean, it was just disjointed for large organizations, but it was also disjointed at the individual level. So as you mentioned, you know, different students are bringing their own luggage to learn. Right? So, you know, how someone responds to those adverse conditions, you know, there's so many variables that impact that. It's hard to say. Um, but yeah, we. We've seen students kind of all over the place. And, I mean, to be semi-positive, we have had students that really responded well uh, to that particular mm -hmm. learning environment, whether it was, you know, whatever it is that they were doing in their Zoom classrooms and, and just being able to kind of um, feel unencumbered. I don't know why. You know, typically, students do better with cooperative right. learning, <laughs> things of that nature, but maybe some don't. You know, there's, just as I always tell folks, because we have such a large you know, staff at the high school, talk about 140 teachers at South and 120 at North. So many different teaching styles. Think about how many learning styles there are. So yeah, we, we sold the full gamut. And then my last comment on you is you talked about data, and, and I appreciate you using data. But I would caution, don't get mired in collecting data, because every minute you're collecting data, you're not educating these kids. And we need every minute we can. So I, I, I would just caution you, we need it. But you, you can go too far. That, that potentially can swing the other way, too. So. And I think it's, I, I completely agree. I think it's about working smarter with data, too. Mm -hmm. How are we responding to what's in front of us and making instructional decisions as a result? And I think that that and having a common approach to that across its elementary schools will be a really positive thing because we're all talking about the same things. And you can start to have that cross uh, grade level cross school collaboration, which has already started. We had a sampling of teachers from every building here at Chancellor. All 10 schools are represented. And just the level of collaboration that day was really much needed, much overdue. So we're excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I mean kids have lost enough. Let, let's see what we can do to fix it. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that. So. Thank you. Mr. Roosevelt. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the solution for this is, is on all of us collectively as a board, as an administration, as teachers, even as a community. But in order to arrive at the solution, we've got to recognize the problem. So just like Dr. Thor, I want to commend you guys for actually admitting this and looking looking forward and figuring it out. Um, you know, when we talk about learning loss and we talk about different kids um, that have lost in different ways, it's not lost that these that these gaps, as we're calling them, could also be social gaps, uh, as as they were foisted on to rely on more technology, um, especially at, at a young age. You know, it it, it it troubles me sometimes to think what the kindergarten, the first grade, the second grade, the third grader is thinking about learning, especially as they, uh, which is where I think steam comes in beautifully where they think about how to, how to work with each other. So there's other gaps that are attributed. I mean, even if you think about the kid that might have been out for a couple of days because of an illness or something, or maybe they went away on a vacation, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But then the child comes back to the class and they're not up to speed on what's being taught. It's very easy to have that child then become uh, discouraged you know, by that. And I think that that can be corrosive. And, and children can sort of pick on that element too. They, they sort of figure out who are, who, who's really quick with it and who isn't. And so something like this can also be social um, and, and even mental. You know, there, there's other elements here um, that are at play. And, and this is a result of us shutting the schools down and doing that. So I, I really do want to commend you for, for recognizing this, acknowledging it, wrapping your arms around it, and, and diving in. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, so 
were there any uh, projects or initiatives that they stopped because of the pandemic, things that you were planning to do, tests or you know, things that were in the works, but because of the pandemic, of course, they either stopped before they started or uh, the planning had to be put on the shelf. Uh, can you speak to that? How, because I, I know, not the work of yesterday, but for some of you mentioned something, so I want to see your perspectives on that. And if yes, what do you plan to do about that? So I, I can think of one at the high school level um, that we spent an awful lot of time on you know, pre COVID, uh, and that was the high school schedule. You know, we, we took a, a pretty deep dive into examining our high school schedule. Uh, at the high school, we have six periods. It's uh, the 55 minutes in length, which is a lot of high schools have eight periods that are more 42, 45 minutes, and then you have some school districts that have four periods, block scheduling, that are 90 minutes. We kind of split the difference. Um, so we were really questioning whether or not that was uh, the six periods were, were serving the needs of our students. So we were visiting a lot of different schools. We had committees formed to examine different schedules. Incorporated in that was we had this desire, um, and kind of been an educational trend the long word, but a lot of schools are going to advisory periods and something called lunch and learn, where there's opportunities. This is good for closing the gap too, for enrichment, for re remediation and intervention during the day. So you might have a lunch period that kind of spans an hour, but during that time, students might eat, but then they're going to go visit their science class to kind of bulk up on, on some tutoring. Um, so we were we were getting down that road, and then it was um, you know, pretty much interrupted. So that's something that we're looking forward to resuming. So is there a plan to visit that? So this year, we're looking at the advisory period at both high schools. So those committees have been formed, and we have the potential that we may see that second semester an advisory period that hopefully will serve the needs of the high school population. When it sounds like an advisory period, the way you describe it, would benefit the students tremendously, even if they have what have not learned in law, so they can find out, you know, they can get help when they need it. Yep. So if you can look into that even before the whole you know, curriculum change or like the scheduling, that would be, I think, excellent way of helping the students. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, at the elementary level, I can speak to something similar. We were implementing intervention time prior to the shutdown. We still are, but we're revisiting, as I shared earlier, what that time is specifically being used for. How is it going to be used? How are we supporting students during that time? Obviously, I think you used the word disjointed. Things became disjointed when students were home, and then upon coming back, it was a little tricky too with distancing. Now we're getting back to what we did last year as well, but continuing to strengthen how we're using that time because it's critical, especially when we talk about you know uh, learning loss and, and, and helping students to, to meet their needs. You need that individual or small group time to do so. So although that was in place last year, we're having those conversations at the elementary level I can speak to just to make sure we're using it and we're streamlining our work to make sure that we're maximizing that intervention time and getting back to that. So what about the delay the school start? Because that would also help them sleep a little bit more, right? So they can, you know, function better and learn better. Have you, I know you start looking into that. Where do we start? So it's funny because Dr. Sanko tapped me on the shoulder and said, late, late start oh, time. Because we did, we did do uh, an awful lot of work with that and sleep studies and, and whatnot. And that was, again, something that kind of abruptly stopped when the pandemic. So we'll certainly look to return to that, those studies and uh, further examine that work. I mean, we did do some positive things right before the end of the changes that I think we're seeing now. At the middle school level, we moved the RA period to the end of the day. On um, the elementary, the fifth special, mm -hmm. and you know, so some work did get accomplished, but um, you know, definitely created uh, more disjointed stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want students about that, but I want to say this presentation was really good. I'm very happy we're doing all these initiatives to help the students, you know, get up to speed and 
be able to help where they want. So thank you so much for everything. Other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Hickey? Uh, you actually just mentioned it, but my question was, I know it's a very small sample, but is there any initial feedback on the change to the middle school schedule with the RA program being moved? I think I've heard positive things about it. Um, I, th I think having having time at the end of the day, actually even from, again, I keep talking about remediation and intervention, just an opportunity for students to circle back. Um, there's time to meet with some, some classroom teachers if you had an earlier issue or if you know you have a quiz or an assessment coming up. Uh, I think there's just greater flexibility at the end of the day in general in the middle school schedule. So I think uh, a couple of positive things I've heard from principals. Dr. Forward? You know, I, I, I'll just come in and now I have a driver in <laughs> high school. You'll spend an extra hour after school because that's, to, to your point, Mark, that's a good time talk over a test. Or, you know, so, I, I mean, I, I, I can see it, you know, trickling all the way up with, with kids. It's hard if you've got to catch a bus at 2.15 yep. to, to find that gap. But with, with the driver, you know, I'm, you know and, and, and it's all about um, that, that extra time to kind of hang out, talk to a teacher, find, you know. Um, so, I, I, I got to believe that's going to keep you coming through the closet. Yeah, Tuesday and Thursday clinics have kind of been part of the culture at the high school level. So mm -hmm. we hope that that also happens at the middle level, seventh and eighth grade as well. Um, with some end, end of the day remediation. Yeah, it's, hopefully you can get, some, like you said, some good feedback on it, you know, in the coming months, like how many kids are actually going as compared to, you know, the previous schedule and whatnot. I actually have a question. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't see it. No, go ahead. Thank Please. you. Um, I have a question uh, about Summer Academy. I know that we've been using ESSER funds uh, to Summer Academy. Could you just update us on the status of those funds and what do we anticipate going forward in terms of funding Summer Academy? We anticipate being able to fund Summer Academy just like the, the size that we were able to serve this you know, past year. So we see at least another year of that. Expanded more students, so we're looking forward to that. That's great. It's been a real success. Thank you. And uh, sorry, Mr. Salmon. No, it's great. I've been just a question like that because I was going, I was making a note, a mental note about summer academy. 518 kids is not a whole lot of kids when we have 10,000 kids in Council Rock. Uh, did we put anything, any parameters in place if it is working? Did it work? Are you seeing a difference in those kids? Why were they? suggested to go to the academy where are they now uh, my biggest fear and, and i see this daily from my view um, that that the gap in the middle is separated even more um, advisory period block schedules are great you also give kids a lot of extra time on their hands the good kids will do well the kids in the middle which is a bigger class now take advantage um, so i i like to hear you know things like yeah, we did a summer academy, and, and now the 500 kids who went there are, are doing this much better. I haven't heard that. So <coughs> it's not a shot. It's just like these are things that I want to be able to say to people I talk to, yeah, we're spending money because these kids need it, and this is what we're seeing for the value. It's a return on investment. We've talked about this many times in three four years. So, you know, I, my concern is the kids in the middle. We adjusted the elementary schedule. What are we seeing creative going on in that extra year? Because there's only so many minutes in a day. Uh, and there's only so much creativity you have in those extra minutes. Um, but like these are things that that I see. I, I see, from my perspective, a fifth grader who may be operating at a third and a half grade math level. How do we address that? How do we address kids that are underperforming their grade levels? Um, these are questions I'd like to hear about later. I mean, I don't expect you folks to have the answers to these questions. None of us do. We all have the answers. None of our kids would have been out of school. We would have been in school. Uh, but to your point, Mr. Funk, technology. I told a story where my daughter ran a Zoom meeting when she was in what, third grade with her friends, but she borrowed her teacher's sign on and I walked in the middle of a Zoom and she was yelling at a kid, raise your hand, you're not allowed to talk with you. So, yeah, the kids learn perseverance. And, and, and a lot of kids, that's the same thing. You know, that's something that they never would have learned. So, there are some positives out of COVID, but the negatives outweigh the positives in my view. 
Um, so I, I like hearing this just like our Steve, but I, I want you all to come back and, and just take some notes on some questions that some board members, and I think we can always send more in in the community we see each other often. Um, but they're the things that I want to know. Values for spending money on that academy, because I think 550 kids is, is, is nothing. Mm -hmm. I think that could be expanded to several thousand kids. Maybe that's not enough. I don't know. I, and none of us know. But I applaud the fact that we've acknowledged, as, as it's been said already this evening, that, that Council Rock was a leader in many ways in Bucks County in putting kids back during COVID um, and, and, and addressing some needs. But I see what I see daily where I work. Uh, kids are hurting. Kids need help. Kids need extra work. Um, and there's not enough hours in the day, regardless of when they're coming to school. So uh, interested to hear as we walk this, this year. <clears throat> Uh, where we're going, but this is the type of stuff I think I, me as a board member likes to hear updates on. And it's not, it's more about learning. All of us are learning through this, and I applaud the extra hours. I know I ride by my school, my principal's there on weekends working, putting in the extra hours to get things done for the kids. And that's what it's about, that's what we're here for. So thank you, um, and I hope to hear you from me again shortly. Thank you. Any other board comments? Mr. Roosevelt. I, I, yeah, I, I'm fascinated. Was there a criteria on how the 515 or whatever it was were selected? Or was it just because those were the families that said, thank you, Council Rock, for putting this together. I know my kid has an issue, and here you go. And I thought that the statistics were interesting as far as how many sections mm -hmm. per you know, class, and that, and that the majority was, I think it was third grade, right? But there was a lot in first and second and third as well. So, you know, that's the concern about what this cost, you know, and um, it and it is, I, I agree with Mr. Salmon that, that there is a middle which might be bigger. So how we try to figure out who identifying the kids that do need the help in whatever capacity it is and helping them get that because as Dr. Thorward said, this, this could very well translate into a lot of life issues. Um, even we, we sat around and discussing the path, you know, the pathway, and, and we know that there's community parents out there that are really concerned that their kid get in, a, you know, a certain level of, of instruction at a certain age, and if that doesn't happen, they're never going to get some instruction in high school, and then that could impact what, where their college selection, and that could impact their major, that could impact their graduation. So there's a huge ripple effect that that, that this is taking place. So I think that that's another challenge. Uh, I agree with Dr. Forward, don't get mired too much in the data. At some point, we, we've got to act and maybe finding and identifying these kids and, and, and shrinking the middle, as Mr. Salmon suggested, I think is probably a good place to start. Thank you. Any comments? Okay, Ms. And I want to. Um, appreciate the representation of community members of our meeting tonight. Um, and since you have made the effort to come, I can, uh, open the floor to questions or comments from you. But I'm going to ask that I follow the good practice of our board president, Mr. Salmon, and ask that if you do have a question or comment that, <clears throat> excuse me, it be related to our uh, agenda items tonight, and that you would also limit your question or comment to three minutes. So is there anyone from the community? Yes, would you please uh, come to me? Related to what you're talking about, so I'm okay. um, My name is Gary, and I have a son in ninth grade at North and a daughter in seventh grade at uh, Newtown Middle. And my daughter was in Summer Academy last summer. Um, she didn't do it this summer um, because of um, scheduling and vacations and those sort of things, and that might be why there's a lower number in some cases. Uh, it was longer this year. Last year they had a choice of two weeks at the beginning of July and two weeks at the end, and that seemed a little bit more convenient and just personally for us um, instead of the three-week block. Um, and I don't know how much my daughter benefited from it. She has a specific reading disability, and I don't know that it targeted that specifically. So it was a great kind of opportunity for her to be in school more, but that's kind of the reason why we didn't do it again this year. Um, but I do have another case study. My <laughs> case study. My uh, my good friend actually just this week told me that her rising seventh or even seventh grade now did the math this summer and it was a huge help to him. Like she couldn't say more good things about it. 
So that's one little case study for you. That it that's really pretty helps. good. That's, that's yeah. exactly what I'm so, that's And I have a question about how many years you're going to be able to continue to do it, but you kind of answered that already. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the public wish to comment or question, sir? Chief, yes, please. Okay. I had I had come and actually I came out um maybe a couple times about staff documentation. And so I was hearing you about the board's questions, which question is if they were that I don't think these things were, but I believe the future question is sort of tied into equity and love. And so my question would just be, can we have some discussion related to students with disabilities and IEP? So I reached out to Mary and um, specifically asking about um, I haven't seen this committee or the school board in general talk publicly or provide much public um, uh, opportunity for the public to um, this, to talk about and comment on the special education plan. And so a special education plan was approved by this board recently, I believe August, July. Um, I did go to that meeting, but there was no public presentation. There was no discussion. When we talk about the learning gap, we're talking about students struggling. How are we not including our most vulnerable students, our most, you know, our students that are struggling with IEPs with disabilities? So I just ask that you, as a committee, as a board, take it upon yourselves to have these same discussions for our students with IEPs, our students with disabilities. If I went back, I, I scrubbed all of the um, board agendas, the board committee meetings. I watched the meetings. I can't find a single case where this board has talked about that special education plan. So I'm, please, I'm asking you to please consider our students the equity when, when you talk about learning loss for our students without disabilities to do the same and provide equity for our students with IEPs. And let's bring them you know, equity and talk about their learning loss. Talk about, you know, instead of just approving that special education plan without looking at it, it's not too late to talk about it. So I ask you to please, like, in the future, add on the agenda the special education plan and what are we doing for those students who also suffered tremendously. So, and I, and I, as a parent, I just want to say I wouldn't complain about that. I'm hard, I had a wonderful experience given terrible circumstances. So it's not, a, you know, a reason for me to complain, but there's, you know, there's, given the circumstances, there's room for us to do the same for those students. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just comment on that? Not the negative thing. We just hired a new special ed director, um, and I expect him to shine pretty soon. And I expect this to be folded in. I do not want to, in any way, cast shade on Dr. Lambert, who's coming out as the new one. So I expect that in, in, in the future. Yeah. So and Dr. Do, Ford, do. and that was my reply that we have a new director that we're, we need to communicate with. So absolutely. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That, right? That's right. Okay. And I think there was another question or comment. <clears throat> um, my name is Kathy Cabo. Um, I actually may be a good case study for you because I have four children. One, two were out Council Rock pre-pandemic, and two were in high school. All four of them, thankfully God, had the same um, course schedule exactly. Like I have all the books and all the it's exactly the same. So I can let you know how that lost learning actually affected kids because one lives in Chicago and never asks for money, so that's a piece of success. <laughs> <laughs> One's gonna is in the Air Force and never asks for money. So that you know like and I moved to Council Rock for my return on investment. Um, I just was listening to what people were saying and kinda had a few things. Um, I know you had mentioned about STEAM. My son is an engineer, um, is a, and I my thing about I think you should use the word engineer every single chance you get. You have to stop being afraid to use the big words when they're little, because when they get older, they're going to be afraid of the big words. Like, oh, I don't want to be an engineer. What is that? Mm -hmm. If they've heard it every single year mm -hmm. about music is engineering and cooking is, I had a funny story with my son where I taught him to cook this summer. He was in the, he was in Florida learning how to put nuclear missiles on jets. <laughs> and I said, he called, he said, remember when he said cooking was not a big deal? He's like, um, Rocket science is easy compared to that. But that's in my house. We always use big words. You have to. Otherwise, they're just going to get older and be afraid. So to your point, use the big words as much as you can. Because then, then they get to, they don't want to, they don't mind taking coding in high school. Because it's not a big deal. They're used to thinking early. 
Um, and you had mentioned you were one person with the rocket. What about you using high school students as for their links hours to teach the younger kids? They have to get links hours depending on where they want to go. So let's have them get links hours doing something that they actually enjoy doing. And that's what help you bridge the gap between the older and the younger kids in the same district. You don't have to hire people. You have really smart high school kids who can help you out. Fabulous. So that's my great evidence. <laughs> Uh, my daughter's a junior, my son's a freshman. Do you have another question? Oh, no, no. I'm going to roll there. Sometimes I can let you go a little longer because I can turn the clock off. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. You, you don't have to answer. No, it's fine. Uh, as you talk about case studies, yeah. because we spent a lot of time talking about the academics of the case studies, and really, my concern through all of this, and as I said, I'm looking for as much input as possible, is I think today we rely too much on technology sometimes. And I personally feel that the social skills of these kids have suffered greatly where they don't know how to talk to each other. Everything is now done through your phone, through your computer. Since you had two that were previous and two that are going in it, have you noticed any difference oh, between the older two Absolutely. being more socially adept? Yes and no. I know. My oldest is an anxious introvert. These are introvert, extrovert words that when we were kids, no one ever said. In fact, I didn't even realize them as much while my kids were younger. But I can pick out an introvert and extrovert anywhere. And I've been work. I think. Any activity we can do as a district to get these kids off their phones, a game club after school, a Friday night thing. I mean, they are immature and honestly vicious. They're <laughs> vicious. And so, and it, and it was before COVID. It's not a COVID thing. It's a society thing. It's a phone thing. I'm not, and I don't mean to take away the fact that they're clearly more immature. I can, I see it. The kids who, like I, I have, my kids both have the same teachers, and every once in a while I say, do you ever notice the difference between Matt's year and Mia's year and the maturity level? And they're like, oh, they see it, we see it, it's it's out there. But there's only so much anyone in this room or anyone in the school district can do if it's not fostered at home to take the phone away. And that's really what it is. Like, in my house, they, my kids aren't allowed to have their phone Monday through Thursday, or technology, the cords off the iPad, because you're, you have to study, and that's how I, you know, that's just the way it is, or find something to do. There aren't enough clubs to join that are, you can just put your phone away. You know, I, I think it's great that there are a lot of um, high school teachers put shoe racks on their boards, and the way they keep attendance is to keep the phone in there. Because I said to my, my one son, who is, you know, the rocket scientist, we, I remember going through and I said to him, do me a favor, how many times don't touch your phone for an hour. And then I said to him, okay, fine. How many times did you get snapped in the last hour? He said, like 85. I said, how the hell do you think you can focus on your work if you are answering 85 and five snaps? That's more than one a minute you're being disrupted from your work. And he wasn't even like popular. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> turn off the history. <laughs> <laughs> And I really appreciate I really appreciate the laugh that you gave us. Um, I'm just gonna try and steer us. I'm gonna try and steer us back to the topic here. And uh, so I appreciate it. 
So looking around the room, I'm seeing none. Yes. I just wanted to add something. Um, but again, that's something that it takes, like, comes up often, you know, when I speak with my friends. At the elementary, it would be nice because it would be like half the school fund, even if they're paid. But like sometimes it's nice like that they're just going from work to school, so you don't have to pick them up and drive. So uh, I know there's some programs like Young know, Rare Grants, there's the Chess, uh, uh, you know, and I think that comes with, to our school anyway. But I always feel like there's a lot of time between the time that the school ends and you know evening, um, and that there's after school clubs that kids can go to. It's easier for parents, kids are already there with their friends, you know, kind of like drive around, uh, even if it's me. Um, and then at middle school, what I noticed is there are some clubs, but I don't think they're well advertised. So I'm always like, how can my daughter you know, go check out what they can sign up for? You know, because it doesn't seem like it comes through the emails and things to the parents. Um, and the kids don't always know. Like sometimes they check it and it's posted, sometimes it's not. So like some of my girls are not aware of it. So, uh, but I think that's just a great idea because it's something to keep, you know, kids busy doing something other than fun. Great. Thank you. And looking around the room and seeing no one else, then I'd like to join this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.